and no one's going to get to Arnhem Bridge except on foot. Splendid. Hi there and welcome to AATV. I'm your host Gareth Gadge Harvey and today we're going to look at the uniform and equipment of a World War II British airborne soldier. Now, as usual, these loadout guides are intended for airsoft use only. We're not the Imperial War Museum, this isn't for reenactment. Now, I am a reenactor, and most of my kit is actually at reenactment standard. But in this guide, we'll be looking at shortcuts and quick fixes to actually get you playing as World War II British Airborne on a budget. It's also really important to remember that we're going to look at things like original World War II ammo boots, but when you play in airsoft, you need to stay safe. So, as usual, we're not really going to tell you what you need to do about your eye pro, your gloves, your boots. It's up to you how you stay safe on that gaming field. So as always, we're going to look at the basic uniform for the British Airborne Soldier of World War II. Now, we say British Airborne and we're looking at an air landing soldier, but it's also good for Polish and Canadian with a change of beret, cap badge and some other minor details. Now for the bad news. The bad news is if you've got a wool allergy, this uniform is not for you. Nearly everything in contact with your body, if you're doing it properly, is wool. So to start off, we've got a wool shirt. This is actually a Soldier of Fortune reproduction. It's not quite as thick and heavy as the originals, and I prefer that because really they're quite hot and cumbersome. As part of the basic uniform, the soldier would wear battle dress trousers. Now these were baggy and voluminous and designed after actually skiing trousers of the 30s. So there are two types of these you can go for. There's the 1937 pattern and there's what they call the austerity or 1940s pattern. The later ones delete some of the belt loops, some pocket pleats, that sort of thing. But either one's good for a 1944 airborne impression. So the trousers are actually quite minimal by modern standards. We've got the usual two hand pockets, a first field dressing pocket, and you've got a map pocket here. There is a later version of these trousers made post-war, you can sometimes find cheaper if you're looking for originals, but you'll need to move that map pocket off the side and onto the front. To be honest though, you're better off with a modern repro because those post-war ones are also getting expensive and collectible in their own right anyway. It's also bad news on the boots front because there's only really one choice if you're going to do it historically accurate. Now I'm wearing modern guards ammo boots, which are leather with a hobnail sole. They're big, they're cumbersome. I wouldn't wear them for airsoft because you've got these anklets on, which are fastened up with two little tabs, you can pretty much wear any modern leather combat boot and be safer and comfier if you're just playing World War II Airsoft. If you're reenacting, you're probably going to want to go for the classic option. Now matching the battle dress trousers is a battle dress jacket or blouse. Now again, these are very high-waisted cuts on them, modelled after skiing athletic clothing of the 30s. This is where all the colourful insignia of an airborne soldier would go. You'd have the regimental badge, the airborne badges, the rank, the qualifications, all of those things. Again, two models, this earlier model with pleated pockets and a later model where they delete that for cost saving in war economy measures. It's quite hot, it's quite cumbersome. Mixed with this wool shirt, really, really quite unpleasant to wear. Again, expensive to get good repros, expensive by far to get originals. You can get Dutch ones and Greek ones, slightly different shade, but for airsoft, they're absolutely perfect. So far it all sounds pretty hot and uncomfortable, but there is good news. The actual iconic landmark bit of kit for a British Army airborne soldier of World War II, or his Canadian or Polish counterpart, is the Denison smock. Now the Denison smock is a huge, baggy, voluminous, camouflage jump smock. Originally designed to be big enough to go over all your webbing and equipment, so when you jumped out of an aeroplane, it didn't all go flying anywhere. In reality, they wore the webbing over the top, but they're always big and shapeless. You should look like a sack of potatoes tied up in the middle when you're wearing a belt. Now the great thing about the Denison smock is because I'm wearing this scrim scarf, this is a World War II original green and brown one, you can get plain green ones, put a bit of brown paint on yourself, be a lot cheaper. It covers up that battle dress, it covers up that shirt. I could wear a vest or a t-shirt under here and play in summer and I won't be suffering from heat stroke. Also, in a lot of pictures from Arnhem when the guys are running short of water and they're quite hot because it was a hot September, you see guys playing, well not playing, you see guys fighting, but their sleeves are rolled up like that. So again, it's a slightly cooler option than if you're wearing a full wool battle dress jacket. And nothing screams British Army Airborne more than the Denison smock. So much so that the Parachute Regiment retained it for decades up until they accepted DPM smocks in the 80s. So normally with an Anvil Airsoft TV loadout video, we say, please don't wear insignia or badges not entitled to, because we feel uncomfortable with it, you might not. 
However, with the case of the British Airborne in World War II, there were two divisions of around 6,000 men each. And those guys didn't have the standards of selection and training that modern airborne forces do. They were mass converted from infantry units, catering units, artillery units, given denizens, rudimentary glider training, and red berets. It was really a mark of being in the division. It didn't mark you out as being a paratrooper. Now, I used to be a former Stafford. In the Second World War, the 2nd Battalion of the South Staffordshire Regiment which eventually became the Staffordshire Regiment, were mass converted to be air landing troops. So essentially they were trained how to land in gliders, a very dangerous bus ride if you will. Gliders fell out of service during World War II and the Staffords became regular infantry again afterwards. But if you're doing this World War II impression, it's totally right to wear maroon beret. It's not a disservice to paratroopers because they were not paratroopers. Everyone got one, all 6,000 guys in each division. <laughs> Now, doing a British Airborne impression, you've got quite a lot of freedom for weapons. Perhaps the cheapest and easiest way to do the loadout is to use one of the very cheap AGM-made Sten guns. Even the real ones are quite cheap. Apparently, they cost about 50p each to make in the 40s. And a Sten bandolier. Now, the Sten bandolier holds seven magazines. And really, while they're a convenient and cheap option, the repro one's around about £30. They weren't used at Arnhem very much. They're more of a Pegasus bridge and varsity thing for 6th Airborne. But if you're playing airsoft again, no one's train spotting. No one's going to mark you down. If it saves you spending £100 on 37 pattern webbing, which we'll look at in a moment, just go for one of these. Now, if you're carrying a rifle and you want to travel light, one or two of these 303 bandoliers to carry your ammo, either loose BBs or magazines for your gun. Now it might sound weird not carrying webbing because normally we trick out everything in a loadout but at Arnhem they were without supply for absolutely days. They were using whatever they had ammo for, they weren't carrying their webbing because they ran out of bread mags, their water bottles had run dry, everything wasn't needed so the guys pretty much stripped down to Denison's belts. You see guys with magazines stuffed into pockets, the lot. So it doesn't look wrong if you want to go for that really worry in the field look. <laughs> So small arms for the World War II British or Canadian or Polish airborne soldier really fell into three main weapons. You're looking at the Bren as the section light machine gun, the number four Lee Enfield as the rifle for most guys, and one guy in every 10 to 12 man section would have a Sten gun. So first of all, we'll look at the Lee Enfield, the workhorse of the British airborne. The number four Lee Enfield replaces the SMLE in airborne forces and is used for all post D-Day operations. It's really common, unfortunately airsoft versions aren't, so we can't really tell you where this one's come from. What's probably easier to get hold of is one of the cheaper and more accessible Sten guns. Now as mentioned, airborne forces on paper got one Sten gun per section. The reality is there were enough in the divisional stores for every second guy to have one. And quite often they get as many as they could. Now, airborne forces got the later Sten Mark V, which has a wooden bookstock and it has a wooden hand grip at the front and a pistol grip. This is a Sten Mark II because the Sten Mark II is the most commonly available one in airsoft. It's not quite right for British Airborne of 1944-45. A few were used, but really you want a Mark V. However, these cheap, plentiful, do the job. Many of the operations they did, especially Arnhem, because they ran out of supplies, ran out of ammunition, because the RAF were dropping many air supplies in the wrong areas that had been overrun by the Germans, they had to resort to using captured German weapons. Now, captured kit is really overdone in World War II airsoft, but this is the one time when you can make it work. So an MP40 will look fine, a Car 98 will look fine. You might want to leave the Russian stuff at home, but it gives you more options. Now, sidearms weren't really a thing in World War II as much as they are now. Very few people had them. Officers had them, a few drivers, signals, etc. in some units. Without a doubt, the workhorse and most used revolver of British forces was the Webley revolver. Now, luckily, there are airsoft versions of this, so you're okay there. 1911s were used in airborne forces and Browning high powers as well, so you've got a lot of choices. Don't be tempted to go for a Luger. There's one picture of one guy in a division of 6,000 using a Luger. Don't copy that, it's overdone. <laughs> Now, if you want to go whole hog and wear all the Air One stuff, it's going to get expensive. I'm not going to lie to you. When I started reenacting and World War II Airsoft in the early 2003 to 2005 period, you could get a set of this 37 pattern webbing for about 20 quid. 
Now you're looking at close to 100. Some of the more specialist pouches might even be 50 pounds each. This is 37 pound webbing, quite revolutionary at the time because most other webbing was a 19th century or World War I design. It's a belt, it's cross braces, and different pouches you could attach to that belt and cross braces depending on your job. Now for a standard infantry guy, I'd be carrying, this pouch here has got Bren magazines in it for the section light machine gun. Not for me, they're for my mate who's carrying the Bren. One of the Bren gunner guys carried another two pouches over there, totally bulked out. My own ammo, is either on a bandolier, across my body, or again, stuffed into here, usually with a hand grenade. We move around to the back in a moment, we'll see I've got an entrenching tool. Again, you don't need that for airsoft, but it's part of the look. Some of the boot cleaning kit I carry in there for reenactment. Next to the entrenching tool, I've got a bayonet. And again, don't take those as an airsoft site. That's my reenactment bayonet. Get a rubber, LARP safe one for playing airsoft. So moving along the belt order, we've got a water bottle. Now this is in the early skeleton pattern. There's a later envelope one, which is easier to use, but both of them are a nightmare. It's a metal two pint water bottle covered in felt or sort of well wool felt. And it's got this webbing strapping around it. It's almost impossible to use on your own. You often have to unclip it from the belt, sack it off. It's 70 years old. It's probably corroded. It's got a nasty old cork that's been there for years. Get a modern water bottle from a camping store and get yourself one of the lightweight gas mask bags. Put the water bottle in there, much safer, much healthier. If you're doing reenacting, you will want a lightweight gas mask. World War II ones, easy to find, don't use them. Asbestos filters, same for post-war Dutch ones, but they look fine. Lastly, on my body, you might be wondering what this is. This is the weirdest bit of kit the British Army had for a long time. It's called a toggle rope, and they were using these up until the 90s for a lot of training and selection. So with a toggle rope, on its own, it's a length of around six to eight foot of quite heavy duty rope with a loop at one end and unsurprisingly a toggle at the other end. Now on its own it's not worth very much, it's not very useful but a platoon of 30 men could form these into a long rope, into rope bridges, all sorts of stuff if they need to move heavy equipment across chasms, rivers etc. Pointless for airsoft but looks the part. So with this full load out at the moment I'm wearing the rifleman's issue of kit and as you can see it's a kind of pale green colour. Actually out of stores it would come that same bright yellowy kind of webbing or raw colour that the Sten bandolier was in. So troops be given a form of almost like poster paint called Blanco and are expected to camouflage their kit by painting it all over. This needs doing again. And it should look more like this set here. Now this set is actually an officer set and as you can see those front Bren pouches are replaced with a binoculars pouch, a compass pouch, an ammunition pouch for a Webley revolver and a revolver pouch. Moving around you have an officer's valise have a sack for carrying things like maps, protractors, rulers, anything you need to do plans. Now with airborne forces this is very rarely used because most field officers wanted ammo and bombs. As I said this is one of the first ever modular webbing systems. This shares the same belt, the same brace suspenders, the same water bottle, all that changes are the pouches for the functionality of the job you're doing. What I've done is got a 1944, and they use them post-war as well, armoured core helmet, also used by the Royal Marines, and attached an airborne style chin strap to it on the liner. A lot of guys actually drill through them, put the right bolts in, you wreck it a bit of history, don't do it. With a scrim net on it and bits of scrim, you can't see that it isn't actually an airborne helmet unless you're a real expert. Now the airborne helmet was chosen to be like this because the soup bowl helmet of the Tommy at the time, they thought it might cut the rigging of parachute lines. Early ones, have a leather chin strap and cup. Later ones that were being used en masse around Arnhem by the Staffords have more of a webbing type attachment and suspension area. Those, again, were used for a long time post-war. They're a little bit easier to get hold of. I actually prefer this leather cup look because you can use it for all battles throughout the war. So not only does this net and scrim I've attached cover the fact that I'm using a armoured core helmet rather than an actual airborne one, but it also does the more important job of breaking up my outline as we talked about in a previous camouflage and concealment lesson. Very obvious round bowl shape, not that reflective paint but still slightly shiny unless you break it all up with this scrim. This net and scrim has become such an important part of airborne folklore that you see guys deployed to the desert still putting nets that would be used to attach scrim and local foliage to their helmets now as it's just become a thing that airborne forces always do. The last thing I take on a World War II airsoft game, and I don't always skirmish with it on my back, is a small pack. Now the small pack was supposed to carry everything you needed for 24 hours. It's like the day sack we have today. And originally you'd have your mess tins in it, some rations, a little hexamine type stove, a ground sheet that also doubles as a cape for when it rains, super useful. But because all this stuff got added to the small pack, more than it's supposed to have, including the water bottle was originally supposed to be in there, you see guys looking like travelling tinkers with their mugs and pots and all sorts of things strapped to the pack. 
For that look, I use an old World War II enamel mug and I've wrapped string around the handle so it doesn't burn my hand when I put boiling hot drinks in it. Now, one of the big drawbacks of this modularity of this webbing, and the German webbing of the time, which was 19th century, had exactly the same problem, is there's a lot of metal to metal contact. There's a lot of clanking, it's not that. Not that subtle. You're, you run around in this, people know you're doing it. Which is why you see post-war webbing moving towards plastic fittings and nylon items. So thanks for watching this AATV guide on World War II British Army combat equipment and clothing. If you like this, or you've got something to tell us about your knowledge of World War II, drop us a note in the comments, we'd love to hear from you. Most importantly though, stay safe out there. If you don't know the channel as a regular, like, subscribe, ding that bell, and we'll see you soon. Tom, Tom, the Germans! Protection from what? The Germans. Gadge, mate, just how long is this bridge? Too far, Tom. Too far. It's a bridge too far. It's killing me. <laughs>